Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Michael. Uh, this is Bishek. Uh, we both work at Red Hat at Plumber's team, uh, mostly working on System D. And today we will be talking about uh, Cgroups v2 or unified Cgroups hierarchy. Um, so uh, this talk was um, caused by uh, recent developments. Uh, so. Um, systemd switched to, to uh, so I'll be talking about this, but uh, Cgroups v2 has been in development for a long time. And people have been wanting to switch to it for, for many years. And finally, uh, at the end of the last year, uh, this happened, at least in our corner of, of, of the Linux world. Uh, so uh, systemd uh, switched the default default uh, to Cgroups v2. By default default, I mean that the, that the compile time default uh, setting is uh, version two, uh, and it can be overwritten uh, both at compile time and at runtime. Uh, and uh, at the same time, Fedora decided to, to drive the, the switch to Cgroups v2, and uh, since Fedora 31, we are running on, on uh, version two. And version two is just nicer, so uh, let's talk about it. Uh, and we didn't really know uh, if the, the whole subject of control groups will be known to everyone, so... Uh, yeah, so who in the room doesn't know what C groups is at all? Okay, so uh, there was just one hand. So everybody is C groups expert here, so that, that's very cool. Uh, but I think it would be better still to maybe introduce Cgroups a little bit. Uh, so Linux Cgroups, it's a Linux subsystem that has sort of two main purposes. One is process tracking, and the second one is resource distribution. Uh, and a bit of terminology. Uh, so in Cgroups or with Cgroups, we have a couple of things that we often talk about, and this is Cgroup itself as, as a unit, so it is a sort of a set of, it's a, it's a kernel concept, and it associates set of tasks with a set of parameters for one or more controllers. Uh, then what is controller? Controller is an entity that schedules particular resource. So for example, we have like CPU controller, memory controller. And then the Cgroup, Cgroups are arranged in hierarchy which is a tree of C groups. And every uh, task or every process on a system is exactly in one C group. So, um, and maybe yeah, one more note. Uh, an interface to you as a uh, system administrator or a user of a system is a file system. So C group is represented to you uh, from a kernel side as a file system. So you mount it uh, somewhere. Usually it's mounted in sysfs uh, C group, and that's how systemd sets it up at boot. So if you do ls sysfs uh, C group, you will see all the C groups that you have. Or we have a nifty tool called systemd CGLS, which will print you hierarchy, how it looks like. So the tree structure of a C group, uh, C groups, how they are arranged on the system. So uh, the history. So it all started uh, quite a while ago, uh, and there was something called task control groups in the beginning. Uh, this is not very nice to pronounce, so we now say C groups. Uh, and this, this was kernel 2624. Uh, and then the development of C groups uh, and C group controllers uh, was rather rapid. There were many ideas, many controllers implemented, uh, and it pretty quickly became clear that, this, that the original design uh, needs to be reworked. And uh, to, in 2012, this, this, this rework, version two, was, uh, was announced. Uh, the, the initial work was pretty quick. And uh, I remember when in 2013, uh, people were talking about this. It, it, it seemed like any day we will switch to version two. But uh, well, uh, it didn't, didn't really happen. There was always the next thing that was missing, and without that, we couldn't move forward. And uh, the, the thing that was the major blocker in the beginning uh, was the fact that uh, in version one, we have a, a tree of uh, threads, and in version two, we have a tree of processes. 
with some details. Uh, and uh, people couldn't agree if this is a good thing or a bad thing. It simplifies things, but some people really want to schedule resources on thread level. Uh, and this meant that the uh, CPU controller, which interacts with the scheduler, uh, was, couldn't be merged. And, and well, the discussion continued and continued. And finally, uh, C groups uh, V2 uh, kind of gave in and added support for threads. Uh, so the CPU controller was merged. And then another thing popped up, and so on and so on. Uh, and finally, late 2019, early 2020, we are almost there. Um, so why, uh, what, what drives the, the new work? Uh, this is a slide from uh, the maintainer of uh, Control Group Station Health from, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago. Uh, this is a random walk, and this is, this is a nice summary of how version one was developed. Different people had different ideas. Uh, there was no single person or group uh, watching the overall design. Uh, uh, so there was a design that, uh, well, there was no design. People implemented what was possible to implement at the time. So the, uh, the interfaces that we got, they essentially usually uh, reflect the kernel naming and the, the kernel um, internal details specific to, to any given subsystem. Uh, and then there were some design choices. People didn't know how to use this yet. Uh, so, so the, the design allows for nearly infinite um, flexibility. Uh, in particular, you can do uh, resource management of multiple resources in completely orthogonal ways, uh, which, which, is, which is nice if you have some, some uh, very specific use case. But it also means that understanding this is much more complicated than, than it has to be. Uh, and uh, we, we talk about the hierarchy of C groups uh, all the time. But uh, actually, the, um, in version one, there is a, a hierarchy of groups, but the controller does not have to be hierarchical. So various controllers do things uh, in a way that treat the tree of groups essentially as a, a random set of groups. And then you can have a controller which assigns more resources to, to the children of a given node than to, to this node. Uh, and. Uh, the limits that, that we had uh, were um, the um, resource limits were not uh, often particularly useful. Uh, and because of the design of uh, separate uh, hierarchies, uh, there is no possible cooperation between controllers. And uh, uh, an example is um, when we have a, a controller for, uh, that limits the uh, amount of memory. Uh, if we uh, set a limit on the amount of memory, sometimes uh, we need to swap things out. If we are swapping things out, then we are using I.O. So the, the uh, memory limit and the I.O. limit are tied together. But if, if those two things are in, in separate hierarchies, we cannot, uh, we, there's no, no possibility for us to tie the I.O. usage uh, of caused by the memory pressure in, in, in one hierarchy to, uh, to the processes in the second hierarchy. Uh, and then if we, um, for example, are doing the I.O., we are using uh, the CPU to do, for example, the compression or, or some other operation during the I.O. And this also is a resource that is consumed by this first group. But we, well, separate hierarchies, are, we cannot um, tie that together. And this was a very divisive issue, but generally for, for, for users, it's better to operate on processes because for more, more, most resources like memory, uh, the split into individual threads does not, uh, is not interesting. And uh, what is very important, the, um, the lack of hierarchy, hierarchy city and, and some implementation details meant that the delegation was uh, not uh, secure. It was not possible. Uh, we'll talk about delegation later. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so to show an example, this is the memory controller in C groups version one. And we, we had some limit. 
And then people realized that uh, well, it would be actually good to, to account for kernel memory, so a second limit was added. The first one couldn't really be changed because backwards compatibility. And then, well, okay, what about TCP buffers? They weren't counted here, they weren't counted here, so we have a, a third one. And uh, the process continues, right? And then we have a bunch of knobs like uh, uh, charge at immigrate and same behavior and use hierarchy. Uh, they, they probably do important things. Um, and uh, if we look at different controllers, so shares and weight are as, as the same concept in two different controllers. They just happen to be named differently and uh, use a slightly different set of numbers. Uh, so uh, in version two, the idea is to, to uh, design the naming and this, this kind of interface stuff up front. So every controller has to conform to this. It generally doesn't make any difference for the kernel, but it's much nicer to use this. Uh, so version two, right? We have a single hierarchy. So maybe let, let me skip one slide. Uh, so this is version one. This is version two. And uh, what is important is that, uh, I mean, maybe not obvious, is that here each controller uh, uses the whole tree. I mean, first there's the controller, then, then there is the tree. We cannot have a controller in some tree that, is, that goes halfway. So for every, every controller, we essentially need a different tree if we want to have different depths. And in version two, we have one hierarchy uh, and controllers that go from the root to a certain level. Uh, the, way, the, the, the reason why we want to cut off at a certain level it's not just to reduce complexity and configuration. It's also that when we are accounting resources, this, this causes um, resource users on its own, and we want to uh, disable some controllers partway through the tree to, to make the whole thing a bit faster. Uh, so the, the, the interface is much more consistent. There is, some of the controllers have been thrown out, uh, and everything is supposed to be hierarchical. Uh, and the, I mean, resource accounting is not trivial, and the, the, in, over those 10 years, we have uh, constructed some better ways to, to, to count uh, resources. Uh, and we, uh, in version two, the idea is to expose high-level knobs without those little details that reflect the internal kernel structure. Uh, and uh, the limits are soft in the sense that uh, it is, um, they do not cause the, the process to be killed immediately, but they, they slow it down if the limit is breached. We will return to this later. So uh, to quickly summarize the state, uh, most controllers uh, have been uh, ported one to one. And uh, uh, apart from some naming differences, there is not that much uh, change here. Um, the CPU, in version one, the accounting of uh, CPU usage and the limits on CPU usage could, in principle, be two separate hierarchies, uh, which does not really make much sense. So it, almost always they were, they were mounted together. Uh, and there is just one uh, controller for that in, in version two. Uh, oh, and uh, the patches for uh, the huge TLB controller have been merged to uh, Linux Next, so they are expected to land in, in two versions, I believe. Uh, another thing that was blocking the switch to version two was the lack of uh, the freezer controller. Uh, and in, this is a classical uh, case of a, of a controller that is not hierarchical. It's just using the, the, the tree as a, as a set of um, uh, groups to, control, to, to group processes. And this, this has been replaced by a um, C group freeze attribute that can be called on, on, on a C group and causes the C group and its children to, to be frozen. Uh, and a bunch of stuff that was not really controlling resources but doing um, filtering has been replaced by eBPF filter. So uh, devices controller uh, blocks processes from access to, to certain devices. And the, the networking controllers, they would uh, uh, interact with the, uh, with the with IP tables to, to 
change routing and uh, priority of packets. And this has, uh, as you can see, then the pattern is uh, generally to replace everything by EPVF, which can be attached to the C group and uh, does the same job, but in a, actually in a more flexible way. Uh, yeah. So delegation. Yes. So uh, now we have a basic understanding, like. What, what, what are the major differences between uh, V1 and V2? We know that basically V2 is much nicer. And also V2 allows us to do delegation uh, to less privileged code or to, to non-privileged code in a sort of a controlled and secure way. So delegation is a concept uh, in, in C groups where basically a C group manager, usually for example system D, will give up control of part of a C group hierarchy to a different process. So we have a tree, C group tree, and subtree of the tree will be controlled by a different entity than, uh, than system D. Uh, so that could be, for example, uh, libvert or uh, some container manager. Um, and so the way this works is, as I mentioned, C group are exposed to you as a file system. So if you actually have this on the next slide, I think. Uh, yes, so this is the C group tree. And basically, this is the output from system DCGLS. And all nodes in, in that, oh, yeah. uh, so nodes in that tree are, are, are basically, they correspond to directories in a C group file system. Uh, and then we have like processes running in those, uh, in those C groups. So, uh, for, for purposes of delegation, we can think of uh, C group as, as a directory, basically. And then uh, we see here that this C group, which, is this, which corresponds to this directory, uh, was delegated to user, to, to process that runs as users bishek. And users bishek now has access to these control knobs, C group .proc, C group .threads, and C group subtree control. And also, it, the, the, this directory has been shown, so now users Bishek can create sub C groups in, in that directory. So then we can subdivide resources that are, that are given to this parent C group the, any way we like. So we can create uh, other sub C groups and then control, <clears throat> control them and delegate resources further. And by the way, why are we actually speaking about delegation? So we picked this topic because it comes up on and on, uh, especially people ask, uh, people that do system software, like for example, libvirt people and contain, people that do container managers, has to deal with the concept of delegation, and we think it's sometimes misunderstood, especially the last point on a slide tends to be misunderstood quite often. And that's that the cutoff basically where the control uh, of system D ends and where you can take control does not, uh, is not at the directory level. Because as we've seen, some of the things here are still owned by root and hence this is the ter ter territory of system D. And this is because if you would be able, if you would be able to uh, write to these files, you would basically, you, you could essentially affect uh, our changes in those files would have an effect, uh, could have an effect on sibling C group on this level, on the same level in a C group tree. So you are basically not allowed to do that, and you can only subdivide the resources that, that this C group has. Uh, so, and basically, that's that's pretty much it when it comes to comes to delegation. So hopefully, if you are writing uh, some system software. Uh, it is a bit more clear like what delegation means and how, uh, where the responsibility is. So the C groups that system D creates for you are still territory of system D and you can create your own C groups here and control those. And it should be mentioned that uh, this is kind of clear in the case where the um, Delegate T is less privileged and has, is running as a different user. But it is quite usual to, to have this state where everything is still owned by root. And for example, the, the root that controls the hierarchy is system D at the top and libvirt at 
is the de delegate T, and then this is, well, less obvious. But the, but the rules are the same, it's just that they are not enforced. Yes, that was actually the, uh, the, the bug that we discovered in, in Libvirt recently, that uh, sort of there, there is a bug in delegation, and, and Libvirt was assuming that it has full control of this C group, which is not true. Um, this is still the system D territory, um, I mean most of it. Uh, so also one, one thing to mention, you can delegate only, uh, you don't have to delegate all the controllers. Uh, you can subdelegate or you can delegate uh, only control for certain controllers. So the delegate option in system D, oh yeah, so you do delegation uh, with system D simply by setting a unit property delegate equals to yes. But since uh, system D 230 something, I think six, now you can also say delegate equals and a list of con controllers. And that would basically mean that system D would set up delegation, but in the delegated subtree, it would enable only, only these controllers. Also delegation can be nested. Uh, this is, uh, so uh, think of a container running system D dash dash user instance. Uh, this is the example of uh, when, when we basically get into the state where we have sort of nested delegation. So we have a delegated subtree and then part of that subtree is again delegated to someone else. Uh, and yeah, resources are divided hierarchically. Uh, so, okay, so this was a concept of delegation. Now we have another sort of bit that is a bit weird, but we should, I guess, think, uh, I, I, uh, we should uh, talk about it, and that's threaded mode for C groups. So what, does it, what it means? As Bishak mentioned, V1 operated on threads, V2 operates on processes, except there is a big asterisk, and that's a threaded mode. So uh, there are certain controllers, like CPU and CPU set controllers in C groups V2, which are sort of, uh, kernel talks, kernel documentation talks about them as threaded controllers, because the, uh, if you have a CPU controller enabled in a, in a, in a tree, you can then turn some uh, leaf C groups into sort of threaded C groups. And how you do that? You do it by echoing, uh, string thread it into a control file that it's called cgroup.type. And now you turn basically this C group into threaded C group. So what does it mean? It means that you can you can then create sub C groups which you can which you then also have to turn into threaded C groups. And then you can put uh, so you can then uh, hierarchically distribute CPU resources, not to processes, but to threads. And this was also a, sort of a major blocker for some time for merging a CPU controller. And well, uh, yeah, for the most part, you, d you work with processes, except sometimes you can work with threads because there are major use cases. For example, uh, Libvirt is a major user of this, and it uh, basic, basically manages uh, QE movie CPU threads, uh, and it puts different vCPU threads into different uh, threaded C groups. And it, and it is worth mentioning that this is apparently the only user of this, at least according to code search Debian.net. Yes. So, well, yeah, this was a major blocker for a long time, and there is only one user, so maybe it shouldn't be so major in the first place, but yeah, this is what we have. Uh, okay, so we have uh, delegation threaded mode, and now I will be talking about uh, why basically, the, one of the main reasons why V2 is so sort of like much, much nicer. And this is like resource distribution uh, models in, in V2, and then we finally have some like same docu documentation and sort of common understanding how we distribute resources along along that tree and what it actually means. In, in V1, it was the interface was uh, you, you know giving to you as a as an end user a lot of in, in kernel uh, sort of details and there was a lot of knobs and it was like unclear what, what echoing some magical number into certain file actually means and this is now much clearer with uh, c groups v2 so we have uh, weights 
and then we have uh, limits and we have protections and we have allocations. So I will be t talking basically in turn about uh, each one. So, uh, well, in V2 we had uh, shares and weights and now finally in V1, in, uh, or in V1, in, in V2 we finally have just one, we have weights. And this is basically, uh, so if you give, for example, uh, some CPU weight to certain C group, uh, this basically means that C group gets some fraction of a resource that's proportional to the weight. That's basically what it means. Uh, then we have limits. Limits are a bit uh, maybe easier to understand because these are actually like sort of hard limits usually. So for example, memory.max is a good example. Basically, if you go above the hard limit, then the OOM killer will be invoked in a C group. So C group can consume only up to the amount of resource that's, config that's configured. Uh, then we have protections. If I am not mistaken, we didn't have any protections with C groups V1. Yeah, this is an entirely new concept with C groups V2. Uh, so we say that C group is protected up to, up to some configured amount of resource. That means that if the usage of a resource is below certain limit, all is fine. If we go above the limit, then kernel will start to do something. Depends on the type of a protection. Uh, I will be talking about a couple of examples in, uh, on the next slide. And then we have allocations. Uh, we had this even with the V1, and this is basically sort of the exclusive uh, allocation of some finite resource, for example, uh, real-time budget. Uh, and with all of them, the overcommit is allowed except for allocations. Allocations, uh, you, use, you have certain amount of certain resource and you have to sort of divide it somehow. There cannot be any overcommit. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, again, just a slide that shows that we have uh, sort of some limits and protections and we have hard limits and soft limits and uh, different types of protections. Uh, I will be talking about that on the, on the next slide, but maybe Zbysha can comment also. Right, so uh, you, you can admire my uh, skills, uh, graphical skills. So we have, uh, so the protections, uh, the limits are easier, right? We, have, we, we set a limit and uh, there's hard limit and the soft limit. And the soft limit is actually the main limit that you want to set because uh, it says that the, the, the service, the given service, the given, given control group should use the resource up to this level and then all is okay. If it goes above, then we kind of nudge it towards being below the soft limit, for example, by slowing it down, uh, taking the resource away from it, but nothing too bad happens. Uh, and uh, the hard limit is like a safety limit above which the, in case of M memory, the umkiller will be invoked. And then we have protections, uh, and they, uh, in, they generally are specific to, I mean, the, how this is implemented is specific to each resource, but in case of memory, uh, mm, if, we, if we go, uh, if, 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 if the uh, amount of resource available to the protected C group uh, cannot be given to the C group, things happen to other control groups to, to other processes, and those other processes are uh, punished so that our protected control group can get uh, the, the resource that was um, assigned to it. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, if, we, if we are um, below the low protection uh, level, uh, the kernel will uh, reclaim memory from other processes and will uh, um, uh, skip our C group. Uh, and uh, if and if we but it still reclaim is still possible and if we if we are below the uh, minimum protection uh, no reclaim whatsoever can happen so so this is almost like an allocation of the resource to the to this specific c group uh, yes uh, thank you <laughs> so uh, so for example for for uh, memory memory c group we have uh, a uh, couple of uh, limits and, and protections. For example, memory mean, memory low. Uh, basically, Zbyszek already explained what, what they do. So uh, 
I'll just say that uh, the difference between mean and low is that one is soft and one is hard. So, so, me, so uh, mean actually, me, it's hard memory protection. That means that if the, if the usage of, of memory for the given C group is below that limit, the kernel will never try to take away um, pages from, uh, from, this, uh, from processes of that, of that C group. While with memory.low, uh, if there is no, well, basically no memory to be reclaimed from, from unprotected C groups, the reclaim algorithm will also target processes in, in this protected C group. Uh, then we have memory high, which is uh, uh, its memory throttle limit. So if, if our memory usage goes above that limit, then uh, we will be put under a sort of heavy reclaim pressure. So the kernel will try to take or swap our pages to the disk, for example, and try to free the memory that we are using uh, that is above the limit. And then memory.max, we already talked about that. That's basically we will get unkilled when we go above. Uh, so that that was that is memory, and then for example for for block I/O we also and for I/O controller we also have uh, some protections and some um, uh, yes uh, some limits. So we can say we can set uh, weights. So this this is sort of an analog to CPU uh, weight or to the weight in a CPU controller. That's uh, it should be noted that this is work conserving. That basically means that. It, which basically means that if there is enough resources for everyone, kernel doesn't do anything. Only if there is a uh, sort of a resource contention, then, uh, then kernel will sort of actually look at the configuration here and it will try to, uh, try to distribute the resources according to, the, to, to our specification or uh, according to our configuration. So, so which ones are web conserving? Uh, I await. CPU. Also, right? And yes, and, and then CPU that's, weight, yes. That's, yes. All, that's it, right? Mm. Mm, yes, possibly. And also, well, I mean, also IO latency. If you are below latency target, nothing is happening. Only if you are above the latency target, then kernel will try to sort of punish the processes that are in unprotected C groups, so your latency will be again below the target. Uh, so then IO.max, uh, you, can, you can sort of say, uh, set absolute uh, bandwidth limits per device. You can configure it in bytes per second or IOPS. Uh, it's quite flexible, the interface, how you, uh, how you can do it. Uh, and then IO latency, so that's per device uh, latency target protection. So basically you are saying that uh, for a certain IOs that go to certain block device shouldn't be, uh, sh shouldn't wait more than certain amount of time. And if that happens, then the kernel will try to do something so it doesn't happen, basically. So it will try to slow down IO from, from unprotected C groups, so you will be start, you will be below your target. Uh, yes, and uh, one more note. These things are low-level uh, control files in a C group hierarchy, and it should be noted that system D has a higher level options for all of them. So look at uh, man page uh, system D dot uh, resource control, and you will find high, uh, high level options and a higher level system D APIs for all of them. And in general, just use system D, and you have to sort of Forget about all these low-level details if you if you are not really a, a person that writes some system software like Libvirt, for example. Yeah, and should be mentioned that the controllers, uh, the knobs in System D, are mapped uh, to both uh, versions of the hierarchy. So uh, System D does, um, I mean, smooths over the transition. Uh, so let's talk about uh, the current state. Um, so the, most of the software doesn't care. I mean, the, the system D cares and some select programs care, but uh, most, most, most software that doesn't, except for <coughs> stuff like Kubernetes and Docker. Uh, and they're, generally, they're, the, the support for version two is rather spotty, which is a bit strange because it's not a really big surprise that this thing is happening. Uh, the nice thing is that um, uh, 
the the stack which the stack from uh, from Red Hat Podman uh, and the associated tools they they all work nicely with version two, uh, and libvirt also got uh, support directly as a as a as a response to the to the change in Fedora, uh, uh, Java, uh, SnapD, uh, oh, Siran, Cryo, okay, a bunch of uh, things. Uh, and uh, Docker, Kubernetes, and uh, some other stuff is, uh, well, version one at this time. And this is, this is a slide uh, from uh, uh, Felipe Sattler's uh, presentation at All Systems Go. And uh, I did some corrections here because stuff is changing to green quickly. I mean, you can see what changed since last year. Uh, but still, Docker uh, and some stuff here on the right, it's, well, will not run nicely on version two. Uh, as far as you know, Docker even refuses to start at all. So. Um, but is, the pro progress is happening. I mean, there are, there are pull requests being sent to, to various uh, repositories and, and things will improve, hopefully. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, the, the switch in Fedora happened uh, a few months ago and uh, it has been surprisingly smooth. I mean, there has been no major blow up. Uh, th th this thing has been in preparation for, uh, let's say, five years, and suddenly we do this switch, and I mean, some container people are, are happy. If you run Docker, you need to set a kernel command line parameter, but apart from that, things seem to be going okay. Uh, and that's uh, more or less it. Uh, to summarize, uh, we have a kind of nicer hierarchical system uh, with safe delegation and a consistent interface, uh, higher level knobs, uh, soft limits, uh, stuff, par parts of the, par things that don't need to be a hierarchical and don't need to be tied to the control group hierarchy have been replaced by uh, EPPF filters, which gives people more flexibility and uh, we didn't talk about it, but uh, better monitoring tools are being developed, in particular the PSI interface, which gives feedback uh, about uh, actual uh, resource contention at the C group level. Yeah, and uh, basically last slide, if you want to talk if you want to have a look at uh, some of the materials that we used uh, while preparing this presentation, uh, the the new kernel documentation. So this is that's uh, oh, uh, oh yeah that's the link secret v2 da 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 HTML. That's very nice. You if if you want to know all the low level details, you can have a look there. And then also uh, regarding delegation and how all these things works. Uh, when it comes to systemd, uh, there is a there is a upstream page on systemd.io, C group delegation. So if you are writing some system software, container manager or whatever, uh, have a look have a look there. And there is a bunch of other presentations about about this topic uh, on, online. So yeah, questions? We have a few minutes. If anybody. Um, mm, as far uh, so, so, so the question was that uh, control files uh, for, of uh, I/O controller are all uh, focused on specific block devices, and whether there is some work going on um, to be able to also configure uh, or uh, not configure, but affect a file system layer with C group settings, and I. Don't know. I am not. I am not aware. But if you use uh, higher level of options that System D provides, System D at least can uh, translate, for example, paths and can resolve uh, file system paths to block devices. So, so you don't have to know and, and even care about major minor numbers and whatever. So, the sort of low level details of a kernel interface, System D will do the translation for you. But that's probably not what you are asking about. Uh, oh, there's a comment from Leonard. 
Wait. Um, so it's an interface to the I.O. elevator, like how you can, can tune the I.O. elevator. That basically means um, uh, it only applies to devices that actually have an I.O. elevator, and file systems do not have their own, and neither has complex storage, right? Like, so if you have, like, I don't know, RAID device and, and stuff and LUX, and these all appear as block devices, you would never actually configure the the resource uh, settings for the higher level fake block devices, but it always needs to be propagated down to the to the actual physical hardware, um, which actually has these I/O elevators. And uh, Systemd will help you with this, as um, as uh, Michal said. So we will figure out like if you specify a, a path in a in, in the file system, then Systemd is smart enough to some degree to trace this down the stack. So it will uh, figure out oh, is this on Lux? Is it on like DM crypt, DM verity, whatnot, figure out what the backing device is, then figure out, oh, is this is a petition, figure out this is a, until it finds a device that actually has a, has a IO elevator. It's not perfect because it doesn't cover write and things like that, but uh, yeah, so for the most case, you can actually ignore the fact that it doesn't do anything about file systems because you can still specify the file system pass. So, there was a question. So has there been any work on GPU C groups? Uh, can you explain what would you mean? I don't think so. Uh, so is there a connection between, um, I would call them traditional tools like NICE and uh, early limit and so on? So those are per process uh, controls. And of course, a, a process can fork and then it gets the same set of resources again, right? And uh, so C groups are nicer in this regard because the, the, we assign a, and, and forking does not change the, the um, resource limit. Is, is there, an, uh, when you said those latency limits and stuff like that, is there something which does like complete picture of, because you can set up impossible constraints to satisfy when, when you ask that every C group gets that, latency below something. If, is there something which controls and tells you, okay, I, I'm above the limit, I cannot satisfy this anymore? So as, as far as I know, there, there is nothing that would do this for you. And uh, also, I think advice in a kernel documentation is to uh, have a, I mean, to run your workload, have a look at io.stat, a cgroup uh, control knob, which reports uh, statistics like uh, maybe look at the PSI, pressure stall information, and uh, figure out like what's what's the sensible uh, latency targets are for your storage and your workload. Uh, so there is nothing uh, there is nothing uh, that would do this work for you, as far as I know. And and yes, you can you can set things uh, I guess in nonsensical ways. So you should experiment, benchmark, and try to figure out like what what are the same values. Yeah, so except for some of the hard allocations, uh, it's totally okay to have nonsensical division in the sense that to overcommit the resource, this, this is explicitly okay. I do have to ask if you nice a process inside a side C group that the process, uh, the C group scheduler still schedules this process with 50% amount of time, what can be done about this? If, suppose that you, in one terminal, you run, run some compilation and you run it with nice and 20. And the C group system will ignore this priority. Well, I don't know, I haven't tried it recently, but some maybe few years ago, I tried this and I ran a compression with nice and 20 
and I run a different workload if in a different terminal and both the compare and the other workload was having 50% CPU. So it ignored the nice command completely. So the way you should see it is like you have the C group tree and that gives you a tree structure, right? And then um, you should think as if at the bottom of this tree, right, like at the leaves, you still have like these processes. And what you configure as weights on the C groups, you configure as nice value on the, on the processes, but it, it would be as if you had one specific C group for every process at the very bottom of the tree, I'm depending on where you put the root, but I put it at the top now, um, uh, uh, that has the nice as the weight, basically. So um, if you nice some, some process, then it doesn't, it shouldn't have effect on the rest of the system. It should only have effect on its immediate uh, uh, sibling processes inside of its C group. That all said, resource isolation in Linux is not as good as it should be, right? So uh, um, while we are working towards that goal, that if you have a misbehaving uh, workload in some C group um, uh, uh, and really, really misbehaves, like takes a lot of memory, load, takes a lot of uh, CPU, currently, unfortunately, we are not at that point yet where the other workloads wouldn't be affected, but there is what we're working on with, um, like, I don't know, there's UMD and stuff like that from various parts of the of the of our user base, like emb embedded um, desktop people want this, so that we come to this point where we finally can guarantee full resource isolation, so that as m much as it is possible with modern hardware, yeah, uh, if you have a misbehaving workload, then it shouldn't affect the rest, and if it's too misbehaving for the system, right, it takes too much CPU, then eventually we'll kill it so that the other stuff can continue. Um, Affected like the stuff like the passive stall information, for example, should be seen, I guess, as one part in the puzzle to come to this point where we have this kind of isolation. But no, we are not not there yet. It's a limitation of the kernel. But people, like in particularly Facebook people, are working toward this goal. So maybe we'll have this soon enough. We're getting closer and closer, and maybe yeah. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.